come with me. I want to take you back to one of the most difficult moments of my life. It was March of 2012. I was sitting at my computer screen. I was staring at a letter. I spent a long time struggling to write. And just as hard as it was to write it, it was even harder to find the courage to press send. That's because this wasn't a normal letter. This letter held a secret, one that I worked so hard all my life to protect, to keep hidden. And I knew that once it was out there, my whole life, my whole world was likely to change. So I agonized over this letter. I read it over and over. And then one night I mustered up the courage and I just hit send. Whew. Right? I'm supposed to tell you, my secret's out there. I felt this overwhelming wave of relief. But I didn't. I was terrified, and rightly so. I knew that this secret would change the way people saw me, and I thought I was prepared for their judgment. But nothing can prepare you for an overwhelming tsunami of hate, senseless, blind, crude as it may be, but still absolutely devastating. Still, it's one of the best decisions I ever made, and I'm going to tell you why. I'll give you some context. I'm Egyptian. I'm a proud Egyptian. I'll always be a proud Egyptian, even if the Egypt that I grew up in became increasingly rigid as I aged. Politically, socially, religiously, the powers that be created an environment that choked the freedoms of millions of people. Anyone who didn't fit into the normal narrative that they set for us, anyone who dared challenge those in power, certainly. But not me. I was safe. My grandparents were famous celebrities, literally revered in Egypt, and as their grandson, I inherited this admiration. In fact, I was often referred to as Egypt's favorite son. You know, growing up a Sharif in Egypt, that's kind of like being born a Kennedy. Or, well, look at me, Kardashian, <laughs> maybe. I, I don't know. The point is, I had every opportunity in the world. I got to be an actor, as you heard, a spokesperson for top brands, even an underwear model. I've since rediscovered carbohydrates. My mom says I'm looking healthy. That's nice. Thanks, mom. But the point is, if I wasn't overly exposed, I was certainly visible. But I was also forced to be invisible. You know, being in the public life, people thought they knew me, but they didn't really know because I couldn't let them see. Yes, I'm Egyptian. Yes, I'm part of this famous family. But like I said, I have a secret. I'm gay. This part of me was something I kept hidden because it was something that didn't fit into the Egypt I knew, the Egypt that scoffed at human rights and persecuted people who were different. You know, being gay in Egypt means living in near constant fear. While homosexuality is not technically illegal there, persecution, discrimination, they run rampant. The LGBT community are often charged and arrested for crimes such as obscenity, prostitution, inciting debauchery, and so forth. You know, as a teenager, I remember seeing coverage of the Cairo 52 when a disco called the Queen Boat was raided on the Nile. 52 men arrested, charged, tortured, tried, ultimately convicted of such crimes. Even those that were ultimately acquitted had their names dragged through the media, their reputations destroyed, were forced to undergo invasive medical examinations. They were rejected by their families and by society. I always worried that that would be my story one day that I would get caught the same way. I heard similar stories for years, and you continue to hear them to this day. If you look here, this is a still image from a news report just last year. A journalist, I won't give her credit and I will not name her, orchestrated a raid of a bathhouse with police. They stormed in, arrested all these men, ushered them out naked, filmed them, and accused them of homosexuality and spreading AIDS in Egypt. That was the headline story on the nightly news. The story, completely fabricated, by the way, but the hate that drove it and the fear that it instilled, that's very real. You know, as a gay man, I felt isolated and lonely, and I felt like I didn't have a place in my own country. And it's gonna sound trivial to you, but Maybe the only source of solace that I felt came from Hollywood films and TV shows. 
Shows like Will and Grace. <laughs> Seeing scenes like these of people living openly and authentically and happily, being embraced by people around them, they provided me with great comfort. They made me feel less alone. They helped me realize that being different wasn't bad and that there was a community out there, even if it was many miles away in Hollywood, that loved and supported the invisible me. In 2012, we, I saw a glimmer of hope. As many of you know, this was a time of great change in Egypt. The country was in the midst of a political revolution. Behind us were the jubilant celebrations in Tahrir Square. But ahead of us lay uncertainty. There were hope that things would change. There were promises of a more open and tolerant society to come, but really it was anyone's guess what the new Egypt would look like in the wake of a revolution. It was a formative and fragile time for our country, and I knew that this was the time I had to finally settle my internal struggle and add my voice to those calling for an open and inclusive Egypt. I was a public figure. I was given a voice. But with that voice comes a responsibility to use it for good. So I wrote the letter. I revealed my secret. I used myself as a litmus test. I challenged those in power to react. With the eyes of the world watching, I demanded that equal rights be given to all citizens, regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, what have you. You know, I knew for, full well from getting my master's degree in comparative politics that when entrenching constitutional principles, if a group is excluded from the outset, it could take centuries before the issue is revisited. The piece immediately went viral, it went global. It was number two on Yahoo, number three on Twitter. And I was being inundated with hateful messages from all over. They ran the gamut from snide comments to death threats and it was impossible to know what threats were real, which were credible, but they were so constant and so extreme that one thing became immediately clear. It would be a while, if ever, that I would get to go home. And I still haven't been home. Not even to bury my beloved grandparents. I fell into a depression. I had suicidal thoughts. <coughs> but almost worse, I nearly convinced myself that I should have never hit send. But then something wonderful happened. Maybe I'd missed them in the avalanche of hate, or maybe they came later, but soon I started to see messages like these. They trickled in slowly, and there weren't many at first, but their impact on me was huge. They convinced me that I had made the right choice, and they put something into focus that has been at the heart of everything I've done since. Just as I took comfort in TV shows and characters that I could relate to when I was growing up, I realized that my story could maybe help others feel less alone. Emboldened, I became the national spokesperson of the world's largest LGBT media advocacy organization, where I honed my skills and my message as I prepared to push for equality back home in the Middle East, no small task. And finally, three years after coming out, I was ready. I was ready to face my demons, and I conducted my first Arabic language TV interview live as an open and visible and proud gay man. It was a program with millions of viewers. Four million watched live, some 20 million afterwards. The host is essentially the male Barbara Walters of the Middle East. And what was important about it is that it was going to be the first time that many people in the region heard directly from an LGBT person, speaking openly, honestly, appealing to their hearts and minds as someone they watched grow up from a young age. Again, I was scared, I was inviting a reaction, and so I braced myself for another onslaught of hate, and to be sure it came, but this time it was diluted. With an unexpectedly strong wave of support, even more messages like before, messages like these.
A lot has happened in the world since then. In some places, life has improved for LGBT people. But in Egypt, the situation has regressed. Every day I receive messages from LGBT youth who find it difficult to go on, to find the courage to survive another day. The pendulum has really swung back in Egypt towards government-mandated discrimination and intolerance, which means that once again in Egypt, silence feels like the only option. But it's not the only option. I've come to believe that while my story may not change the course of a country, it can be a small part of inspiring and challenging others to live openly and authentically. And if my story can inspire others, their story can inspire others. Stories hold incredible power. And this power is no longer in the hands of a few. It's no longer in the hands of a centralized source. We have a connected world. And with the power of new media, this power has been dispersed to all of us to share our stories and to create change, and to accelerate acceptance. My story is just one of many millions. But that doesn't make it small. That's what makes it huge. We're not alone, and together, with our stories, we can inspire millions more. Thank you.